and it is really my privilege to introduce uh, these two speakers. We have Jamie Geiger that, um, funny enough, I've actually worked in two companies. We both work for Sands as authors. Uh, he works at Grimm, and I just started at Scythe, which are uh, sister companies as well. Yet we don't know each other that well yet. Um, so it's funny. Uh, Jamie has uh, been doing some awesome stuff from the in the community. He is a graduate from RIT. He runs CTFs. Uh, he's the author of day four of Sam's most advanced class, which is Security 760. And he recently got that certified title right there, certified instructor. So congrats on that. Uh, and uh, hopefully get to... Uh, meet you more as uh as we work together there we go there he is and um he will be presenting with steven sims who is uh one of the co-chairs here steven is the curriculum lead for uh both the pen test and cyber defense uh courses so i've worked with steve quite a bit for a number of years now uh even though he doesn't look that approachable since he's like all punk rocker, uh, he is. He's extremely humble and um, a great person, great mentor, uh, has helped me through uh, highs and lows as uh, I've written classes and, and gone through this process. Uh, he's also older than me, but somehow looks younger than me. So I don't know how that happens. But uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you guys and uh, good luck. Great. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. And uh, so I just want to add a couple more things. If you can, do you have control, Jamie, over the slides? I do not. I think it's you on you at this point. I don't do it. You have to click in and hit next. Maybe I do. Oh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's titled Windows 10 Kernel Exploit or Mitigations and Exploitation, which is a pr pretty heavy topic for one. Uh, a 40 minute slot. <laughs> we have enough uh, difficulty covering that in one day in an entire uh, course. And also waiting until the very end, I think um, I'm gonna blame uh, Jennifer Santiago, who uh, works on the Summit team for, for being the one that put us at the end just to torture everyone, no, I'm just kidding. But we'll make it fun, but it is a heavy topic, right? We're talking about Windows 10 kernel mitigations and it's pretty, it's pretty brutal stuff. And unfortunately, you really can't hide from this anymore. So there's a couple photos. You've seen me already a few times, but that's Jamie over there, of course. And George already did the introduction, but I, I will add on that I'm, I'm very happy to have been introduced to Jamie. And I know a lot of us uh, know him at SCOTUS, knows him, and he moved very quickly through the SANS vetting of becoming a certified instructor and has become a great friend. And uh, I was really looking for someone to help take over some of 760 and he jumped at the opportunity. And out of all the days, um, I was like, well, which day do you want to start with? You can just take a day. And he chose like probably the most difficult day, which is kernel uh, exploitation. And that just shows the kind of person he is. He just wants to go at it and, and get the most advanced stuff. And he does an amazing job. So I'm very happy to have him as part of the, the team. It's, it's, it's the most off, fun stuff, Steve. It's the most fun stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I chose it. <laughs> so uh, exploit mitigations, what are they? now? I did a talk maybe a month or two ago, and I was actually surprised to see that we had over a thousand registrations. I'm pleasantly surprised, but surprised because the talk was focused on Windows 10 exploit mitigations, specifically looking at exploit guard and some of the more modern controls that have been put into place. And I just didn't know that that was that sexy of a talk that people would want to come to. And so after that, um, having done so well, I think it went well, um, we decided that this would be a good talk for HackFest, but moving into the kernel realm. So what you see on the slide here is a bit of a Venn diagram where we have multiple categories of exploit mitigations and where we merge there in the middle, that's where we want to be from a security perspective. So I want to take advantage of mitigations that are enforced and controlled by the operating system itself, ones where the compiler adds in code for us, things like stack canaries you may have heard of or uh, dynamic base. And then of course, if we want to take advantage of something like an, an, an exploitation toolkit or framework that's offered by Microsoft in this case, we could do something like exploit guard, which 
You may have heard of the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, Exploit Guard, of course, being the successor to that toolkit. The mitigations that you see up on the screen here, it's a bit of a user mode edge, but a lot of these are also implemented into the kernel. Things like control flow guard, randomization, data execution prevention, a canary, so on and so forth. These are things that span both user mode in ring three and into, of course, kernel mode in ring zero. So I just wanted to kind of show this slide as an example of there are different categories and from a defensive or security perspective, we want to get there in the middle and take advantage of as many of these as possible because certainly there are ways to get around uh, these mitigations at time or simply avoid them. So this is a silly slide here, but I've used it many times because I think it's a good um, <laughs> image to use. On the left, we've got this dog who has no protection, right? Not even from its owner, but let's not go there. Um, this, there's no armor, there's nothing, it's just open. And on the right, we've got a dog that's got armor on. And on the left, I'm saying that would be Windows 10 without mitigations. If you don't turn this stuff on, because a lot of the things in Exploit Guard or even ones enforced and your system control panel that also affect the kernel. If you're not utilizing these, then obviously you're unsafe and many of them are not turned on by default. So you've got to understand them. And that's really what I pushed for in the last webcast that I gave was you need your system administrators to understand how these mitigations work, the impact that they have on a performance, how effective they are from a security perspective and how difficult to get around them um, and other factors. And unfortunately, sysadmins are very busy and may not have the time to be able to uh, put in that, that work. So part of doing these types of presentations are all about trying to help people who may not have the time to put in the technical uh, work to understand how these things work under the hood and just you know, cut some corners and give you some insight. On the right there, of course, that's where we want to be. If we, if we fine tune and we turn on these controls, you're gonna make the life a lot more difficult for an attacker. And I can say I've been doing this for quite a long time and in the XP days, in the Windows 7 days even, versus now, it is really night and day. I remember back early on in my days of wanting to do exploitation or doing it, uh, people would say that stack overflows are coming to an end. The days of write what, where, and primitive like, overrides, those types of things are coming to an end. And it's been 20 years, and they're still here. It's still possible. And you hear about these controls like control flow enforcement technology and shadow stacks, and, and those are the ones that are really going to start killing some of the most cutting-edge techniques we use reliably, like return-oriented programming. And as that starts to happen, attackers, of course, are going to look for more uh, clever ways, or, and, they're, and they're going to be harder. It's, we're losing the, the time when you used to be able to teach a technique, and, and that technique would just work globally. And then the compiler developers or the operating system developers would put in a new mitigation, and we would come up with some global way of being able to get around it. And uh, we're losing that. It's, it's unfortunately getting closer to a point where if you're using something like the latest build of Windows 10 and you're turning on these mitigations, life is, life is painful. But on the good side of that, uh, if good side of that, if you want to learn how to break this stuff, is the, this stuff is worth a lot more money now. If you have to chain together a, a remote code execution bug with a logic bug that allows you to escape the sandbox with a privilege escalation bug that gets you a root or system. Uh, that's a lot of work, and, but it's a lot more money. You, you can get paid hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars if you're able to get this stuff uh, working. And if anybody wanted to know up there in the top right, that's what I consider Windows 7 to be at this point. There's really nothing you can do to protect it anymore. You, you can pay and get patches for that operating system still. But what I'm talking about is the mitigations, they're not backporting exploit guard. A lot of these kernel controls are not being backported. Uh, you're pretty much stuck with what it was available to do. So um, what are these targets mitigating? And Jamie snuck this uh, animated GIF here, or whatever you want to call it, this meme onto the slide. But it's, it's, it's funny. What it's talking about is use after free bugs and things like type confusion, where in C++, if you're using smart pointers, it's a way to dynamically uh, track references to an object. And an attacker wants to prematurely decrement the reference counter 
and an object to zero. And if they can do that, they can get it freed prematurely. And what that means is that an attacker can get that memory reallocated while there's still a reference to it. So when the, when the process goes to access that object, it's been replaced with something malicious and it could allow an attacker to get a right what where or take over um, the, the process itself. So that's just a great example of a mitigation that was, and I would say it came to a head in about 2013, 2014, it was probably or arguably the most exploited and discovered bug out there in existence. It was, there was a ton of us making a lot of money off of these types of bugs by disclosing them to the affected vendor or going with an ethical uh, bounty program or buyer. And so as these different types of bug classes become uh, saturated, as attackers go after them and repeatedly find them, then of course the operating system vendor or compiler vendors, whatever, have to go and, and figure out a way to mitigate that. So they, you want to teach your developers how to code more securely, use better um, functions, things like that. But you, when you're talking about complex code, you're always going to find bugs. It's just inherent. Uh, there's no way a developer can test their code under every possible condition and circumstance out there. Um, that being the case, we have to rely on these exploit mitigations. So if, if you haven't noticed, um, there's a lot of focus on Rust, Rust being a very uh, new language, relatively speaking, and, and much more safe language that also harnesses and has a lot of the power of low-level languages. So you see Microsoft and Google and others experimenting with um, potentially rewriting the Windows kernel using Rust, which would get, get rid of a lot of these types of bugs that Jamie uh, is going to walk through here coming up in a bit. A double fetch being another great example of a bug class that was exploited heavily by the, the folks in uh, Project Zero. This, uh, every once in a while, I, I bug Matt Miller, who escaped, of course, at Microsoft for an update to this diagram. I just, I find it to be incredibly informative. And if you look at the timeline in 2014, you can see if you, the color coding, things like use after free and type confusion were pretty big. So 2013, 2014, very, very big. And a lot of the focus there was on browsers and other user land applications, not as much with the kernel. So anytime people go after the low hanging fruit or focus on a particular bug class, as I said already, um, that gets mitigated for the most part and, and everybody moves, they refocus their attention um, onto what is available in, in the, on the attack surface. So that's a great one to look at and I put the, the reference in there if you wanna go and take a look on your own time. So I'm gonna introduce a bit of the kernel mitigations here and then Jamie is going to take over and um, as expected, I asked him, I was like, hey, do you have a canned demonstration you can do with some kind of kernel mitigation? So of course, so we'll end the presentation with that as well. But this diagram here, um, what it shows is on the left, the main image, you've got on the bottom of that image, user land, and it indicates that on the right. So that's user land, that's ring three. That's where our applications are running. That's where we're supposed to be most of the time. When we need the operating system to do something uh, privileged, say write to the file system or open a file or cross any kind of significant trust boundary, we've got to ask the kernel to do that for us. And the most common way we do that is by executing something like a syscenter instruction through NTDLL, which would be the primary interface to the kernel. And then once we get into the kernel where you see system service dispatcher, it's going to get trapped. So that system call we're making is going to get trapped. You've got the kernel split into multiple components like the kernel executive and the kernel itself. There's many things in there that we just don't have the time to cover. But that system call gets trapped and it checks things like the token to see if you're permitted to request the operation you're asking the kernel to perform. And then if everything looks okay, it's gonna look up in a dispatch table and fulfill your request and get back out of the kernel as quickly as possible. Because if something goes wrong in ring zero, obviously you're running at system and you can do whatever you want. So historically, most of the focus for exploitation has been in user land, but you can see that little Venn diagram over on the bottom right. And what happened is people focus so much of their attention and, and exploit all the things in user land that it gets pretty well mitigated. 
And even if you can get some kind of code execution, you might be in a sandbox, you might just be running as a non-privileged user, and you've got to find a way to elevate your privileges. And so as such, attackers were forced to go and experiment and dive into the kernel. And the first time you go into the kernel, it's quite intimidating. And we find people who take 760, which is our advanced exploit dev course at SANS, um, often saying that that's the most difficult day to approach. It's just many, many undocumented structures and components and objects, and it's a bit intimidating. But like with anything else, you start at the beginning and you work your way up and just document and, and suffer like the rest of us do, right? You, you can't really cut too many corners here. You've got to put in the time. But as you see in the top right, it says less exploit mitigations historically. Again, um, there's various reasons as to why we don't we didn't initially put mitigations into kernels of operating system. And that is uh, one example could be overhead on a user mode process, no big deal. Maybe if Firefox slows down or if Chrome wants to take even more memory up, um, not that big of a deal. But if you put a bunch of these mitigations in the kernel, that overhead's going to affect the entire operating system and everybody takes a hit. Also, if um, a mitigation in user land causes a process to crash, and that's very common that maybe you're running a new update to exploit guard comes out and it's just not compatible with something in Chrome and something causes a crash. Um, that's not that big of a deal because it's in user land and you can just turn off that mitigation and start up the process and you're good. If a mitigation causes that issue in the kernel, you're likely going to have a blue screen and, and things are going to crash uh, the whole operating system. So there's more reasons beyond that, but there are various reasons as to why these mitigations weren't as prominent in earlier Windows kernel versions, but now they kind of have to be. And I would say um, Jamie's going to get into virtualization-based security, which is a really fascinating topic. Um, if you've heard of Credential Guard, that's pretty much um, a bit of that, where we've got a, a, another kernel instance running in a secure mode. And again, Jamie will get into that, but when you start going into that realm, uh, life is going to become very painful to in regard to exploitation and in regard to getting around these mitigations because really you're reducing the attack surface to only things like a broker um, as a target. And again, things are more painful. You see a lot of people switch over to things like connected car security or the internet of things and, and other environments, ICS environments, things that aren't as in good of a state as the latest version of Windows 10 running in an enterprise um, because those targets are rich and you, there's not a lot of this, these obstacles that you're faced with. So we've got researchers, of course, looking at all the things and, and that's what we need. But Microsoft, Google, um, some I was going to say, but I won't now uh, due to recent events, but have put a lot of amazing and did a lot of amazing work uh, in regard to mitigations and improving the security. It's quite fascinating to see this whole thing evolve as it has. So why attack the kernel though? Because that's, you know, you're getting to a point where it's, it's, there's not as much left. There's not as much low hanging fruit. And eventually you're going to have to get code execution as system if you want to be able to do anything significant. Things like a Windows 10 remote code execution, command and control type vulnerability. If you've weaponized that, especially if it's something like zero click, meaning no one has to do anything to get it to run, uh, like phishing, uh, those go for millions of dollars, US dollars. And it's, it's, you know, and if it takes you a year or two to find one, but you can get paid $2 million, that's a pretty good time investment. So that being said, this is an overview of the types of things that Jamie's gonna be walking into, and I'm gonna hand over control to Jamie now. Not sure if I can uh, actually flip the slides here so you may need to just flip oh there we go we got control all right so i'm uh, gonna start off with kernel mode code signing here so this might be something you're familiar with this was introduced back on 64-bit windows vista uh, i know i said this is kind of windows 10 mitigations but uh, we want to go back and kind of look at what's still there and what's still effective and why some of these protections may not be in their current form kernel mode code signing is actually one of the examples of uh, protections that you're going to see that, you know, has is sort of a double edged sword, right? You, you have this protection, you want to force 
code to be signed by a legitimate signer to have it load into your kernel. Uh, but on the other side, it's actually really easy to defeat. And so uh, what we have is, uh, you know, the digital signature will have a, um, a, a some trusted authority, Microsoft themselves or a third party signer sign a, a kernel driver, a .sys file uh, that's developed by a third party. And uh, that code will be able to run inside the kernel. Uh, so if you don't have that, you won't be able to load the kernel driver, it'll fail. Now I'm gonna note that this mitigation is actually only present on 64-bit versions of Windows. Uh, and that's part of the reason why um, the patch guard, which we'll talk about soon, uh, is not enabled on 32-bit uh, versions of Windows either. So uh, Windows kind of has, or Microsoft kind of has this uh, set of tests, uh, the Windows hardware quality labs, and then beyond that, the extended validation, uh, which basically uh, ensures or tries to ensure, tries its best to ensure that the code that's going to be running in the kernel or the code that's about to get signed is not you know, susceptible to basic things like stack overflows or um, corruption, memory corruption, things like that. There was a study recently, or uh, there was a researcher recently uh, that published some information about um, the, I think it was the Trend Micro AV driver um, bypassing extended validation checks. It would check if it was running in that environment and then it would disable some things. Uh, so kind of interesting that providers are trying to get around those uh, tests in order to um, kind of uh, be able to do things they weren't supposed to uh, and then get signed. So the extended validation is, is a process where you have to actually send uh, your code to Microsoft and they'll validate it. And then, uh, you know, at this point, you know, you can kind of say most of those are pretty good, but on the other hand, Microsoft can't find everything, right? So uh, this is reducing your attack surface. Again, a lot of these mitigations are gonna be reducing your attack surface. And so if you have this mode in server 2019 turned on, you can actually only allow these specific EV sign drivers. So if you're running all Microsoft stuff, uh, you don't really need to have anything else. So that's useful. Uh, there is a fantastic set of labs by, uh, I think it's the evil bit on Twitter, uh, Kasaba Fitzel, uh, who he has this whole like set of labs dedicated to bypassing kernel mode code signing. It's really, really great. I recommend you check it out. I'll post it up in the hallway uh, or the track one or both uh, after the talk. Uh, just somebody remind me of that. So we can defeat this in a number of different ways. Obviously uh, kind of, getting at uh, drivers that have existing vulnerabilities is a great way to do this. And we're gonna see this later in the demo. I'm gonna exploit a signed driver in order to uh, escalate my privileges. Uh, other than that, there are some pretty legitimate signed drivers that are malicious. Uh, there are things like uh, read, write everything that is just completely validly signed by Microsoft. And you can just use that to read and write arbitrarily in the kernel. Uh, Cheat engine is another example of a, of a driver that allows you to read and write within processes legitimately, and it's signed. Um, you'll also see that once a driver's signed, it'll just load. Um, there's, uh, there's actually a blacklist that's being implemented in the newest version of Windows, the newest development version of Windows, 20H2, uh, which will come out probably uh, late this year, early, yeah, probably late, late this year. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, known bad drivers will fail to load uh, if you have that feature enabled inside of 20H2. Supervisor mode execution and access prevention, uh, which are SMEP and SMAP. So SMEP is kind of an older one that's uh, implemented fully as of Windows 8, but we're looking at uh, in Windows 10, SMAP. And so uh, SMAP essentially, the, the scenario that this is meant to defend against is somehow we get control of the instruction pointer inside of the kernel and we're able to get control and call things. Well, before SMEP or if SMEP is off, you can jump to a user mode page. And if you can control the process fully, uh, then you may be able to control what's mapped where in user mode and you can just jump to your code. That's easy. So if you get instruction pointer control, you jump to user mode code and then you have execution, you have shellcode execution. Easy enough. With SMEP, you'll get an access violation. So if you try to jump to user mode code when you're in kernel mode, when you're executing code in kernel mode, you'll actually get an, an access violation uh, because that page does not belong to kernel mode. Now there's a number of different bypasses for this. Uh, you can 
flip off the SMEP bit inside of CR4, uh, inside of the CR4 processor register, or uh, you can uh, toggle the bit that indicates the ownership of that page. Uh, so the page tables uh, are the virtual to physical mappings with all the attributes like read, write, uh, no execute, and the owner. So if you flip that owner bit, you can make the operating system think that that page is owned by the kernel itself, and then you can execute code in that page. Um, this kind of gets more complicated when you start to talk about the mitigations for uh, Meltdown kernel virtual address shadow, which we'll cover soon. Uh, that kind of separates the page tables for user and kernel mode. Uh, but there are still some shared pages that you can get uh, to uh, get access to. Moving on to SMAP, Supervisor Mode Access Prevention. It's a similar concept, but with data accesses instead of execution. And if you've done any kernel uh, work before, you'll know that a pretty common task within the kernel is accessing user mode data. So I'm going to may maybe pass a uh, buffer into the kernel uh, where it's going to fill it out. When do we do that? Mm when we go read file, maybe. If we read from a file, the buffer is going to fill out, or the kernel is going to fill out a buffer from the, uh, the driver that handles the disk. So say I'm, I have an open file handle, I'm going to read a file, uh, and then I call read file, I call into the kernel, it'll fill out that user mode buffer. We need to be able to access the user mode buffer. With full SMAP on, we wouldn't be able to do that, but there is a kind of a little trick where if you set the AC bit in E flags uh, using the uh, STAC instruction, the stack instruction, you can start to access user mode uh, data addresses. And then on the other side of that, if you want to clear that bit, you use the CLAC instruction. Um, when I say very limited form here, uh, I sort of refer to uh, the fact that the kernel, when you call a system call, right at the top of the system call handler in the kernel is a STAC instruction, that stack instruction that's going to toggle, essentially disable SMAP. Um, it's still enforced for some types of data accesses like uh, descriptor table, but for the most part, it'll just be enabled for, um, it'll, it'll be disabled when it's set. Uh, drivers can, drivers and other parts of the code can actually, uh, kernel rather, uh, can actually decide to implement and enforce SMAP by clearing that AC bit, and then you access user mode addresses, they would set that AC bit again. So that's uh, those two mitigations. Again, uh, that one's similar uh, to SMAP in the defeats, uh, where if you can call, uh, do a return-oriented programming attack uh, and actually get gadgets to execute that'll write into CR4, you can disable, CR you can disable it there, or if you can call that uh, STAC, instruction, uh, you may be able to take advantage despite SMAP. So that's implemented in Windows 10 1903. Uh, that's present, the, the set AC instructions there, and the, the, the feature is actually turned on in Windows 10 1903. Oops, so there's a lot here. Uh, Steve had mentioned kernel ASLR uh, briefly earlier. So the, kind of the two pieces we have here uh, are the kernel ASLR and then the address leak protection. And so uh, over time, as people report vulnerabilities or address leaks, Microsoft is fixing them. And then due to the like bug class, so uh, say references to uh, kernel in the desktop heap or the PEB, uh, you'll actually find that Microsoft will go and fix a whole handful of those bugs when somebody reports one. Uh, so when we're talking about kernel ASLR, we have high entropy ASLR, which uses, uses a lot more bits of the address to, uh, to enforce that randomization. And then force ASLR is actually going to force modules that don't have that dynamic base com compilation flag to be dynamically relocated. Um, and so in, when we see in the kernel, you know, Kernel ASLR, KASLR was implemented in Windows Vista, uh, and we had you know four bits of entropy, which is basically just a matter of time if you're guessing. Uh, up to now, with new versions of Windows 10, 64-bit, you have 22 bits of entropy, and that's like a yeah, good luck, never in a million years. Um, I I think you can do the math on it if you were to guess, if you were trying to brute force that that address, uh, and it's it's not feasible. 
uh, four bits is nothing. And then you have that 22, which is huge. And then, like I said, uh, address leak protection, Windows 10 is going to, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of mitigations for these address leaks, um, but removing uh, kernel pointers from user mode. And uh, there's, there's one longstanding technique that if you could get an arbitrary read, the HAL heap, the hardware abstraction layer heap was actually a static location inside the operating system, inside the current running kernel. And so if you could read the HAL heap, there were actually a lot of very useful pointers uh, into the kernel, which would help you de-randomize where the kernel is. And then uh, some other uh, functions that may be useful to you when you're writing an exploit. And so unfortunately that's now randomized. Um, and there was a pretty recent uh, exploit, I think, I think their username on GitHub was chompy1337. Uh, they published an SMB ghost exploit, which is uh, pretty interesting where they actually go and search, search through the HAL heap. If you're looking for some research to do uh, or some, some code to look at, uh, that exploit's really cool and I can post that as well in the chat. Uh, a couple of other things that we're looking at here for KSLR and uh, kernel address leak protection, uh, randomizing the page tables. So there used to be this uh, kind of statically located uh, self-referencing entry uh, that is now randomized. And also the base of the page table used to be at the same virtual address, and now that's randomized uh, as well. And so we see that it's, it's harder to predict where things are. Just a note at the bottom here, you used to be able to just query driver bases. So I don't need an address leak if I'm medium integrity uh, still, which is great if you if you look at back at to uh, Windows Vista implementing mandatory integrity control, uh, you have low integrity processes being unable to query these things. So your browser tab perhaps uh, shouldn't be able to query the base of the kernel. Uh, and I kind of agree with that. And so if you, sh if you shift the process down to low integrity, uh, you're able to actually block these things from getting the addresses of drivers in the kernel. Um, but if you're a medium integrity and above, uh, even on the current versions of Windows 10 and you're local, you can still get those addresses. Control flow guard. So we actually have, uh, actually have the demo that I'm gonna do is uh, kind of proving out kernel control flow guard. Uh, this is forward control flow protection. So this is checking if the target that we're about to jump to is valid. And if you look and the best explanation of this I can, I can provide is actually in the uh, two IDA blocks below. If you see on the Windows 7 version, which is on the left, you'll see that it does a direct call to that memory address. And on the right, we have the Windows 10 version that's been compiled with Control Flow Guard. Again, this is both an OS and a compile time control here. So we've got uh, on the right-hand side, we have uh, the offset being loaded into RAX, and then we call Guard Dispatch iCall, where if Control Flow Guard is off, then it will just jump to that address. Not very useful. But if Control Flow Guard is on, it actually looks it up in a bitmap inside the binary, and uh, if that bit at that bitmap offset um, using that address that we're about to jump to is a one, that means it's a valid call target and the uh, guard dispatch I call handler there will jump to the function. If it's not a valid call target, that means that something's going horribly wrong, like we're trying to call a ROP gadget or something, and it throws an exception. We'll see in the demo later that we don't even get that far. It actually crashes, crashes trying to look up the uh, the offset in the bitmap because we go way too far. We would provide it with some ridiculous address. So just a note here that this is going to only really be enabled on Windows 10 uh, Pro and Enterprise when core isolation is also enabled. So it's not something that you can enable separately. Um, yeah. Steve mentioned virtual-based security before. This is sort of, uh, it's like, it's terrifying and also very, very interesting. This is like a whole book, whole books could be written on just this and, and looking at how this is implemented and uh, how to attack it and, and how to develop for it. Uh, so this is essentially a Hyper-V backed security mechanism where you've got different trust levels. And so the higher the trust level one, uh, for example, the more secure it is. And so we have the, a secure kernel mode and an isolated user mode in VTL1. Now, each virtual trust level does still have the concept of ring zero kernel mode 
and rank three user mode. And so you can run uh, normal EXEs, normal specially signed EXEs called trustlets inside that isolated user mode. And then you'll see uh, secure kernel.exe inside of uh, ring zero VTL one. And they talk back and forth via an RPC channel. So this diagram, I know it looks fairly familiar to the Windows logo, sort of on purpose, um, but just the coloring being uh, in user mode, you know, we have our things like LSAS and NTDLL, and in kernel mode, uh, NTOS kernel to EXE, we don't really trust anything that's running there. Um, that's just kind of the rule. That's why it's, it's uh, red and orangey yellow. Um, in the other side of things, the VTL1 side of things, you have your isolated user mode where if you've seen uh, a machine with credential guard on, you'll notice that the process LSA ISO it shows up in task manager, but you can't actually attach to it and you can't read, read its memory because that memory is actually in a separate VM. Um, LSAS and LSA ISO communicate again through that RPC channel, uh, ALPC channel. And uh, the result being you have things that you could have normally pulled out of memory with something like Mimikatz being stored in a completely separate VM that's inaccessible to other user mode processes, which is fantastic for security. Um, other trustlets uh, include uh, the MSP, uh, which I believe houses the uh, virtual TPM, and then BioISO, which is uh, going to be uh, is the, I think, biometric um, like video face recognition stuff. And then you have your secure kernel, uh, which has yeah, skci.dll, which is uh, code integrity, uh, and then uh, your cryptographic stuff. I mean, if you can generate cryptographic secrets in a more secure location, SKM is definitely the place to do it. Um, so this is kind of all based on Hyper-V, and that's why Hyper-V now, I think the bug bounty for a, uh, RCE and Hyper-V is, I want to say $250,000 from Microsoft. Um, so... It's a good target. Um, they put full and absolute trust in Hyper-V. So if you can find a Hyper-V bug, you can defeat all of these security guarantees that this virtual-based security thing provides. And that's based upon, and, and you follow that chain of trust down as well to UEFI. And then of course, um, as far down as your firmware, which if you've done any research into uh, firmware, that's kind of where the security stops. Uh, there are, are tons of firmware vulnerabilities for different various platforms. And Microsoft is actually trying to work with vendors to uh, move that chain of trust farther down into the firmware space. So you may have seen device guard and credential guard. Uh, device guard essentially is ensuring that only known good code can run. And so we have this uh, configurable code integrity uh, concept, which, which uh, is enforced inside of hypervisor code integrity. And so uh, what that means is we can actually enforce through a second level of um, paging and a separate level of ac uh, access permissions on pages. We can actually say that certain pages are not, are, are not executable based on a policy. And so if I load some, uh, right now, if I just on my, on my Windows machine without or device guard, I can load code into the kernel and it will just run. So I can just upload shell code to... Uh, I can put shellcode into the kernel and it'll just run I can, if I can allocate a page. If I'm running device guard, I can't do that because the hypervisor actually has a second level of uh, permissions on each page saying what can be executable and what can't be. So I can request executable memory from the kernel in user, or if I have a kernel exploit. And then uh, if I try to run it or put code there and run it, then I'm going to fail if I'm running device guard. Uh, it, it essentially enforces that. And then credential guard, I had already kind of explained uh, where LSAS and LSA ISO are talking back and forth to manage things like NTLM hatches and Kerberos tickets. And so if you're looking at like a Kerberos ticket attack, like stealing Kerberos tickets from memory, you've got uh, LSA ISO is actually talking directly with the KDC and LSAS.exe doesn't see anything in the middle there. Uh, so it's kind of a neat, uh, neat little trick. So like I said, skci.dll is that secure code integrity. Uh, and again, configurable code integrity is going to uh, kind of be the ground truth for what can become executable within the, uh, the kernel and in user mode. So we have strong code guarantees, which uh, essentially is just that concept in the kernel. And then you have user mode code integrity, which is hard code guarantees, which uh, 
make sure that it kind of enforces those things I just talked about for user mode pages. And so if you have both hard and strong code guarantees on uh, enforced, you basically can't make an executable page without proper signing, which is terrifying for attackers. How can I exploit the system if I can't run code? And it has some other tricks in there as well to kind of filter out um, access to things that could help defeat the, uh, the, the, the hypervisor itself, uh, MSR, control register, and DMA filtering. I'm not going to spend a whole ton of time on PatchGuard, uh, pretty much because PatchGuard is incredibly complex and uh, it is ever changing. And so there was actually, a, I'm gonna point everybody at a paper uh, that was done by Tetrain uh, on, I think this was Windows 1803, Windows 10 1803, uh, that basically kind of goes through and walks through some of the patch guard checks. But the goal of patch guard is to prevent critical structure modification. And so if you, uh, try to modify a model specific register uh, or modify where the system call handler is or modify, modify something like the how dispatch table or patch functions, it's going to kick you and throw an exception. So um, it does a lot of different things. Basically all you need to know about patch guard uh, is it runs on a bunch of timers, it protects things like NT functions uh, and it can be defeated, which is really what a lot of people care about uh, with a boot kit or if you, uh, attach a debugger, it just turns off magically because it doesn't want you debugging it either. It's actually very similar. Um, my, my coworkers and I actually have a joke about patch guards that uh, we're pretty sure that they hired, Microsoft just hired a bunch of malware developers and they, they had them write patch guard because it's obfuscated, misnamed, uh, it deletes itself, it allocates itself on the non-paged pool and runs. Like it does some weird, weird things that only malware really does. Um, so if you're interested in patch guard, that Tetrain paper is actually really awesome. They do timeless debugging to investigate patch guard. Other mitigations we've got here. Uh, so there was a whole slew of speculative ex execution bugs uh, to kind of arbitrarily read or um, be able to leak kernel memory out. And so you have two uh, mitigations, one for meltdown and one for Spectre. So the kernel page table isolation, uh, or specifically as Microsoft calls it, kernel virtual address shadow uh, is a mitigation for meltdown. It separates the page, the user and the kernel mode page tables, uh, save for a couple uh, to prevent the, uh, to prevent you leaking out kernel mode data. And then retpoline uh, is the speculative ex execution um, mitigation for Spectre, which was uh, kind of reading data by making the uh, kernel kind of speculatively look into, uh, speculatively look at what instruction was next to potentially leak out uh, kernel, the addresses of kernel instructions. So that is a mitigation for that. Those are both put into Windows 10. Uh, and then we have the segment heap, which could be a whole talk, could be a whole course in and of itself. The segment heap, I've done a hours and hours of research on the segment heap in the kernel. They took the whole user land heap implementation and they moved it into the kernel as of Windows 1903. And so heap grooming is completely like thrown out the window. Uh, and you also have things like uh, segment ownership checking. So if you try to move segments, you try to move a chunk to a different segment, you can't do that because it's it uses some math to determine what segment it's part of. Uh, randomization, pointer encoding, chunk header encoding, uh, things like that that are going to make it that much more difficult to do some sort of metadata attack. If you're familiar with any of the uh, like uh, glibc malloc attacks, sort of similar uh, attacks you'd go after there, but they're really, the, the, the security and the, and the robustness of the segment heap is, is something to be reckoned with, uh, definitely. And it makes it hard to groom to doing, due to the randomness in there. No, no page mapping is a kind of an older one. Uh, that's just basically, mapping the null page. So the first 64 kilobytes of memory and the first 64 kilobyte pages um, are just mapped and you can't map them uh, from user mode. The attack being you used to be able to just on a null pointer dereference, you would just map your shellcode at pages or page zero at, at address zero, and then it would jump there. You have extra complications when it comes to supervised remote execution prevention uh, moving forward, but it's a pretty simple mitigation for a whole fixing a whole slew of issues. 
Um, guard pages for segment heap, they actually have guard pages in between. Uh, these are pages that when read or written or executed from, they just throw an access violation. Uh, so they're, we're seeing those pop up in more places in the kernel. Range checks and stack cookies essentially are compile time controls that are added. Uh, stack cookies, you uh, from Steve's other talk, you should be fairly familiar with, um, which these basically prevent stack overflows. So it's a, it's a value on the stack that if it's uh, overflown and overwritten, that'll get checked at the end and it won't return uh, because the return address is stored on the stack. Range checks, uh, if you have a statically sized array, uh, you'll essentially have a uh, check for, uh, to make sure you're within the bounds of that array if you're passing values to it. And there's a lot of mitigations going forward. These are just some of the examples of them. Um, I had mentioned system guard secure launch, kind of extending that chain of trust past uh, the secure boot uh, when you're running Hyper-V to kind of make the security go all the way down to the firmware. Uh, control enforcement technology is really worth mentioning because it's implemented as of Windows 10 20 H1, but hardware doesn't usually support it. Um, but it's going to be definitely a very scary thing uh, to watch out for, for if you're an attacker. So uh, a shadow stack essentially is when you call a function, the return address is pushed onto the stack. With shadow stacks, it's pushed onto this hardware shadow stack and they're compared when that function returns. If they're not equal, say you smash the stack, then you have a problem. Uh, you it, it throws an exception. Um, and so uh, Alex Ionescu has a paper on con uh, CET that he uh, he published fairly recently that has some internals there. So that's really what we're seeing in terms of kernel exploit mitigations these days. Um, I don't know, I, I know I'm past time, so I don't know if I have time to go into the demo. Like Steve said at the beginning, it's really hard to fit this stuff into uh, even a whole day. I mean, this is part of, like a lot of this stuff is taught more in depth inside of 760. We'll spend more time talking about it, uh, but you know, this stuff is very, very much, uh, it takes prerequisite knowledge of the Windows kernel and also uh, kind of, if you're coming from the attacker standpoint, you really are, it's gonna be a challenge um, to get past all this stuff. And that's what we're looking at from the other side of things. We wanna turn on as many of these as possible uh, and, you know, update our hardware so it supports things like control and close enforcement technology uh, and, um, yeah, so I hope that this has given you kind of a look into how difficult it's getting inside of Windows 10, inside the kernel, uh, and potentially some ideas for some bypasses in the future. Um, part of the demo I was going to do uh, was control flow guard um, and kind of showing that data only attacks will still work. So if you're doing token stealing data only, you can still make that work. But if you're trying to execute shell code, it's a bit harder now with virtual based security and um, control flow guard and all of that. That's awesome. Fantastic stuff. Do you um, have that demo recorded by any chance? I don't have it recorded, but I've got the VMs up here. Um, I don't know if you, I know there's a closing remark, so. Um, How long can, does the demo take, Jimmy? Uh, a, couple, a couple minutes. I mean, I can record it and post it if that would be better. I'll just post it to YouTube. I, I'll just say go for it and then we'll wrap up real quick. Uh, just, yep. okay. If it only takes two minutes, do it. Yeah, I want to text you. So let me share my screen out here. Um, somebody want to enable me to do that? There we go. Let's get this on. Okay. So uh, can you all see my screen? Yep. Sharon. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to walk through here and just show what this looks like. Uh, so we've got a kernel exploit here. Uh, I've got a kernel debugger attached off screen that I'll bring on later. But I want to show uh, two exploits here. We've got one that is a data only attack, which is going to work after control flow guard and virtual based security are turned on. Um, this is essentially doing a token stealing attack to steal NT authority systems token uh, inside the kernel and put it on top of our own token. Uh, so this attack is using a driver, uh, a, a vulnerable driver, uh, the gigabyte driver, uh, and it's something that you'll work heavily with in 760 day four if you take the course. 
So this has copied the system token. And if I run who am I, I can see MNT authority system. Great, that exploit works. Now we're gonna run another one here that is a shell code that is uh, actually jumping to shell code. And so this is where uh, kernel control flow guard is gonna come into place because I, I overwrite an indirect call, actually the one that was in the slide that I had shown before, I overwrite an indirect call uh, that uh, essentially the address that is at the location that's getting called, I'm overwriting. It's a writable function pointer table. And so this exploit is gonna take advantage of that to essentially do the same thing and then run me a shell. Some few more steps, but if I run who am I, NT authority system. So that exploit works just fine. And now if I restore my snapshot that is uh, with kernel control flow guard enabled, you'll see that one of these exploits is not going to work. And we're gonna get a crash and I'll pull over the kernel debugger for that. Um, so when this restores, essentially what I've gone to do is I've turned on core isolation. Remember uh, from the slide, the core isolation uh, is going to also toggle on kernel control flow guard. And so we're running under virtual based security inside VMware here. So I'm gonna run this same exploit again, the memcopy one, which is the data only attack. And you'll see It should. Oh, yeah, I have to reattach the uh, reattach that kernel debugger. We restore snapshots. The kernel debugger likes to to uh, lose its place. Hopefully, I didn't crash here. So reattaching here and going. There we go. And so now you see we have who am I? NT30 system, great. So that exploit worked. But now if I run this other one, if I run the shell code one where I'm again, overwriting a function pointer, we'll see that the OS stops and I'm gonna pull over my kernel debugger here. And we got a crash. And if we look at the call stack, we can see that we crashed inside this guard dispatch I call function. If you remember from the slide, that was what was checking that bitmap and seeing if this is a valid call target. In this case, we didn't make it as far as checking the bitmap we were trying to, but this function that I tried to call was so far out of bounds, it actually caused an access violation trying to look it up in the bitmap from that address. So you'll see that's the KI page fault. Normally we'd get a bug check uh, in that function. Uh, that would be called saying there's an, a violation of control flow guard. So in this case, it was sort of out of bounds, but you see that, you know, when we turn this protection on, we're getting a crash. Uh, and now I'll do, I'll, I'll do go so we can see the blue screen because that's, that's what everyone wants to see, right? Uh, this is actually going to be just, this is going to blue screen with a critical structure corruption now. So there you go. So page fault, non-page area, it actually uh, caused a crash. So that's the demo, uh, just showing you that, you know, you can mitigate some attacks uh, and you, some still work. So like data only attacks with token stealing still work. Yeah, you, don't, last, crash, uh, you, you don't crash it until you get the blue screen. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> Yeah, you gotta make it, you gotta have it go. No, that was- I forgot uh, the debugger in two minutes either. So. <laughs> yeah.